call. Mr. Sweet, would you please call the roll? Sure. Uh, Dr. Paris. Present. Dr. Adams. Present. Uh, Raphael Sweet, present. Ms. Cruz. Present. Dr. Daniels. Present. Thank you, Mr. Sweet. Let's move to agenda item number two. Public comment for items not on the agenda. Members of the public, you may address the committee at this time. Please be advised um, that identifying yourselves is voluntary and your name and your name will be recorded in the official meeting minutes if it is provided at the time of your comment. Moderator, can we please open this agenda item for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have opened up the question and answer panel. If any member of the public would like to comment, please type comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send it to all panelists, or you may simply raise your hand. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, I do see a raised hand and uh, just so you know, we do have a three minute uh, time limit. I'll give you a 15 second warning and call in user three. You are, you should be able to unmute yourself. We'll try. Oh, there you go. You are unmuted. Hi, I couldn't get into the, um, to the webinar, but can you hear okay. me? Uh, we can hear you. Hi, uh, my name is Gwen Anderson. I'm a, a consumer of chiropractic care. And I wanted to ask for more steps to be taken to, to prevent, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a recording, um, to prevent predatory um, actions by chiropractors and I had a recent experience that was disconcerting to me. Um, I felt that um, if I told anyone, they would think I was making it up to slander the person who I think is a very good chiropractor. Um, and I went online and it just told me that there are no limitations of what chiropractors can do for treatment. And I did get some help finding the standards and it definitely the treatment that was suggested to me with quite a lot of confidence is not in the standards. So I wanted a consumer page that explained this more clearly. Um, I don't plan to take any actions, but I do think there need to be um, notifications to the public so that they know that they should be reporting these things. Um, and I would love for anyone who wants to contact me to please, please do get involved. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, All thank right. you for your comment. I, I heard, did I hear um, Ms. Henderson, if I got that incorrect, I'm sorry. But you, you may provide your contact information to the moderator and the board staff will reach out to you to assist you with your uh, comment question. Thank you. All right, and I see no further requests for comment. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank okay. you. Okay, you're welcome. Dr. Paris, this is Sabina again. If you wanted to go, um, there, the staff is trying to contact the court reporter's office, um, unless the new attendee with the name of Dawn is the court reporter. You're welcome to move on to your report while we try to um, work this out. Hi, good morning. This is this is Matthew Block with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, I just reached out to our staff uh, and I was informed that there is no coverage. Uh, we don't have a court reporter available this morning. Uh, I do have the ability to record uh, Mr. Zorick's hearing electronically, uh, if that's okay with, with the board. That's okay with... Uh... That's okay with me if there's yeah and, and we also will have this recorded by a webcast also so there should be two recordings that would be great thank you okay so i'm prepared to do that whenever you're ready okay um well thank you judge block and welcome uh i will i will let you take it from here 
All right. Uh, just before we go on record, is is it pronounced Zorich or Zorich? I just want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right. It's uh, Zorich. Zorich. All right. All right. With that, I will begin the recording. All right, we're on record before the California Board of Chiropractic Examiners, Department of Consumer Affairs, in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of revoked license by Thomas Joseph Zorich. This is Office of Administrative Hearings, case number 20230305588. Uh, we've already established that a quorum of the board is present, but just for our record, I would ask that each member uh, respond audibly when I call their name. Dr. Paris? Present. Dr. Adams? Present. Mr. Sweet? Yes, present. Ms. Cruz? Present. And Dr. Daniels? Present. All right, may I have the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General if present? Yes, good morning, Your Honor. Deputy Attorney General Steve Pyun, P-Y-U-N, uh, appearing on behalf of the people of the state of California, pursuant to government code section 11522. All right, good morning. And Mr. Zorich, you are present and representing yourself, correct? Yes. Mr. Zorich, have you ever petitioned for reinstatement before? No, uh, no. All right. So just to give you an overview of the procedure that will follow this morning, um, Mr. Pion will present your petition first and provide an overview of the case. Uh, you'll then have the opportunity to testify under oath. Uh, Mr. Pion may have some questions for you and the members of the board may have some questions for you. The board is particularly concerned with the rehabilitation that you've engaged in since your license uh, was revoked. After the hearing, the board will deliberate and close session uh, on your petition. You won't receive an answer today, but you'll be notified of the uh, decision in the future, okay? Sounds good. All right, with that, Mr. Pian, are you ready to proceed? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to start by marking for identification and offering into uh, evidence the original petition packet, which I believe has been provided to all board members, uh, to you, Your Honor, and uh, to the petitioner. Um, How many pages does that consist of, Mr. Pian? I'm sorry, I, I spoke over you. Could you repeat that, please? No, it's okay. How many pages um, does that consist of? I believe it is a total of 88 pages. All right. Mr. Uh, Zorich, do you have any objection to that being received in evidence? No. All right. So that'll be Marcus Exhibit 1, Mr. Pian? Yes. All right. Absent objection, Exhibit 1 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And I'll just, if I'll briefly describe those documents. Um, okay. There is a continuing education log prepared by board staff. Uh, confirming that uh, I believe the petitioner has complied with CE requirements. Um, there is the underlying petition for reinstatement uh, with the uh, some attachments, including an emailed personal statement, as well as some CE verifications or certifications, I should say. And then there is a stack of prior disciplinary documents. And um, I'll go through those because it'll be part of my description of the case. Okay. So just a brief summary for the board here. Um, the petitioner was first issued a license by the board back on July 29th of 1989. Um, license number DC20052. That license was revoked effective January 6th of 2019. And I'll briefly describe how we got there. Uh, first in a decision by the board effective October 21st of 2010. The petitioner was placed on five years probation and ordered to pay costs of $20,000. <clears> this was based on the filing of a first amended accusation, which alleged 19 causes for discipline. Um, the accusation was based on petitioner's treatment of three patients and included allegations of gross negligence, repeated acts of negligence, incompetence, acts of moral turpitude, um, <clears throat> administering excessive treatment and fraud related to billing, and then finally, failure to maintain adequate records. 
So after a respondent was placed on probation, effective October 21st, 2010, uh, it was found that by the board that there were several violations of probation. Um, the operative pleading that's in the file materials is the first amended petition to revoke probation. That was filed on February 20th of 2018. <clears throat> and that resulted in an administrative hearing and a final decision in which the board adopted an ALJ's decision, finding that petitioner did in fact violate his probation um, on at least 53 occasions. It's included violations uh, in the nature of a failure to provide quarterly reports at all or in a timely fashion, <clears throat> failure to make part of his cost recovery payments, uh, of the $20,000, it was determined that he did not pay uh, a little less than $5,000. And then also a um, repeated failure to submit quarterly reports of CPA audits of his billing practices. So that decision uh, became final and effective January 6, 2019. And that is when the response license was revoked. I believe petitioner submitted this uh, petition for reinstatement on or about November 5th, 2022. That's the date on his signature. I do note that the petition appears to have a received stamp of December 7th of 2022. Um, and that's all I have by way of a, a brief summary, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Pian. Mr. Zorich, are you prepared to testify in this matter? Yes, I am. Would you please raise your right hand, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimonial given this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, thank you. Mr. Zorich, because you're representing yourself, I'm gonna allow you to, to testify freely in the narrative. Uh, as I said, when you're done, let me know. Mr. Pian may have some questions for you and the members of the board may as well. Uh, but at this time, I am going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, Council. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to go over uh, some items, uh, six items. First, going over the initial probation, then the revocation on probation of 2010, and then read a statement on September 18th. I have a letter, and then uh, go over my letter with the board to you for my rehab, and then final closing. I'd like to spend a few minutes going over the initial cause of the board coming um, for a situation. Um, I was doing work comp at the time. I had a cash practice and a rehab center, <clears throat> and I was starting to do work comp, and <clears throat> I was going out and having work comp patients coming in delivered to me by companies. I was a company uh, chiropractor for a lot of them. They were sending me their work comp cases. And I was sending out for testing for MRIs, CAT scans, and everything on the injured. And I kept getting denied by SCIF. And then after what happened was there was a doctor that was working at SCIF, Dr. Kra, kept denying my uh, testing. <clears throat> this happened after numerous cases. I could not proceed with the cases. And then I wrote a letter to the board, the chiropractic board, saying I was being denied testing for my work comp cases. I wrote the letter to the board, and unfortunately, the letter went over to Dr. Kra, who was working for SCIF and also the board. She was an investigator and a board uh, on the administrative. After I wrote, and then I wrote a letter concerning my situations of the uh, dual. Uh, situation, she, uh, the chiropractor working on for the insurance company on the board. I sent you two articles stating that, that eventually they were all fired. And <clears throat> after three months, after I sent that letter in, my homes were invaded, raided, my homes, my offices, everything. I had SWAT teams come to my house and I had, uh, my children were still home at the time. <clears throat> and um, the next the next thing that happened, there was insurance investigators there. <clears throat> they took 800 files 
from my uh, offices and storage centers. And out of the 800 files, they took out three files. And they, they you know, went through those. And um, I know they said that there was fraud or whatever. But uh, anyway, I'll get that to that statement in my letter. Anyway, and <clears throat> so that after all of that, I received all my files back. And then I was October 2010. Um, I did my settlement to go on probation. I had an attorney at the time, and we were going to go talk about the, uh, I felt was uh, unjustified by Dr. Kra and, and some other people that were um, going over my files. But we weren't going to take it to the administrative law because they did not know that the, uh, Dr. Craw and some of the administration people were fired at the board. And so I decided, my attorney told me, just go on probation. I said, fine. I went on probation. And then after two or three years, everything was fine. I was making my $333 payments. I was doing my audits, which were $1,200 a quarter. And then what happened was, uh, I ran into some financial trouble. Um, number one was is that all the work comp payments, insurance, and everything were, were being stopped. Also, I went through a divorce. The divorce was my ex-wife, and she embezzled from me. She belonged to a, a cult <clears throat> and embezzled um, hundreds of thousands of dollars from me. I did not press charges. I had... We had three small children, and I did not want to go down that road for my uh, kids to visit their mom in prison. <clears throat> so over a period of time, um, I had I built two medical centers, and um, I had to default on those because of the divorce and everything else. And the SBA loans were coming after me, so they were taking out all of my insurance and Medicare payments. So what happened was I could not make my audit payments. I couldn't afford an auditor to come in. And so that's the reason that I kept failing with the reports. I tried to, I put in the reports, but I could not get the audits because I was in uh, financial desire. <clears throat> Then I got caught back up on my reports, and then I received a letter uh, on September 18th, 2019. I, I received a notice from the board, the chiropractic examiners. The board decided to close the case with merit. Unfortunately, I misread the letter and did not understand that the closure was limited, limited to the matter of a debt to my storage company. Um, Complained, uh, uh, a complaint by the chiropractic board. They were going to st close my uh, storage center because I couldn't pay for it anymore. And then storage center reported it to the board. Anyway, I thought that the probation thing was over. That was my fault. I'd like to read my, but the board letter to the uh, chiropractic examiners. <clears throat> um, on July, 10, uh, July 12th, 2010, stipulated some discipline, disciplinary jury order agreeing to stay revocation response license with five years of probation of excessive treatment documentation, et cetera. Conditions were to have quarterly audits and pay off a $20,000 fee for chiropractic board, which is $333 a month, audits cost of $12,000. I did pay $15,000 of the $20,000. <clears throat> Immediately following, I consulted a medical billing to correct the processes of billing and also treatment of patients. Those three files that were taken out of the 800 files, all the other 700 and plus files were correctly documented and, and 
properly um, billing and everything was set. There was no uh, area of fraud. There was no criminal charges pressed against me either. Anyway, on the rehab, I took those cases. I consulted medical building. I took seminars and also read over the treatment of, of uh, on the board about patient quality of care. I also followed the, the chiropractic board's treatment of history taking, billing, examination, workman co workman's compensation injury documentation. As time went along and payments that the board were updated around 2012, I'm just reviewing everything that I had said today. I went through a divorce and embezzlement. Also at the time I had built and purchased two medical buildings that went along with the divorce. <clears throat> I was losing money and could not pay for quarterly audits and also the board chiropractic fees. The SBA loans later, 2000, 2018 small business loans started taking all of my Medicare payments, insurance payments, which basically caused my office to close. I could not meet the probation requirements. I had a hearing with the administrative judge. Decision was denied on my license and was revoked January 6, 2019 should be reinstated. This is all I started back in 2010, 2019, with the loss of my license. With the 2010 issue, I acted immediately to take care of the issues that were put upon me, hired medical consultants to correct all of my reported billing, etc. Since that, since that happened, everything was followed 100%. The loss of my license of 2019 was due to financial loss. That, that since that, I have taken care of all the financial issues and small business loans, the divorce, embezzlement, federal taxes, updated, etc. I am 66 years year old, living on Medicare. I have hundreds of patients waiting for me to come back and treat them, which I have for years. I am an outstanding chiropractor. Chiropractic saved my life. I was a professional downhill skier on the U.S. ski team, and ended up paralyzed at Stanford Medical. It was chiropractic that got me to walk again. I spent the, over the 30 years practicing chiropractic and giving back to the care. I feel like I've paid my dues, and I, and I need to get my life back. Not having my reinstatement to keep me from earning a living and living on just Medicare. The last couple of years, I've been living on Social Security. I was driving for Uber. Then the pandemic hit and basically left almost homeless. I have saved up a little bit of money to start a practice again. These were stressful times. I did seek out professional classes to make me a strong and vibrant human being. I feel strong mentally and physically. Over the last couple of years, I've taken online courses in person for chiropractic techniques, including KST, Gonsed, Dr. Alan Creed, took business courses from Tony Robbins, met with my CPA of 20 years on business rules and regulations. Many courses in nutrition and spiritual healing. I am also healthy. I take tremendous care of my health. I do not drink. I exercise every day motivational and meditate every day. I almost I almost was writing a book about my life. I was a professional athlete and chiropractic saved my life. But now I want to return and get back to something that's always been in the heart to help other people. I'm starting from a clean slate, paid my dues, made my mistakes. I accept my faults and take full responsibility that everything had happened um, with my probations and the failing to, uh, failing my probations. I've never been arrested. I've never committed a crime. I am no way um, anyway, that's that is uh, all I have to say. Um, that's my why I feel like I should be reinstated. I feel like I've corrected everything from the financials that had caused all of this. 
and also the mistakes that I did make in uh, those three files, and they were taken care of. And ever since then, there's never been an issue with it. And um, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Zorich. Before we turn it over uh, to Mr. Pion for questioning, Mr. Zorich, you mentioned that you submitted some documents. Uh, I think about what you testified to with Dr. Craw. Did you provide those to uh, Mr. Pion as well? I sent those to Valerie. I faxed those over to Valerie a couple uh, last week, and she sent them to you. Your Honor, I can represent that I, I have received copies of those articles. Okay. And Mr. Zorich, are you offering those into evidence? Yes. Mr. Pian, any objection? Uh, just their hearsay, Your Honor. All right. Would you concede that they can be received as administrative hearsay, given that he's testified to them? Yes. All right. So, Mr. Zorich, the uh, documents you submitted, and just so our record is clear, that's one Six documents, um, uh, those will be received as administrative hearsay, okay? Thank you. All right, Mr. Pian, questions for Mr. Zorich? Yes, thank you, Your Honor, just briefly. Um, good morning, Mr. Zorich. Good morning. Um, as I mentioned, and I think we both mentioned it, uh, there is still that outstanding cost recovery of about a little less than $5,000. Uh, if reinstated, do you plan to pay that? money back to the board yes i do and you're able to do that yes i do yes and um you know i was reading the decision back when your license was revoked in 2019 and i know it during that hearing you um did raise the notion that uh, not the notion excuse me you did raise the uh fact that you had dealt with financial difficulties because of the embezzlement by your wife so I just want to have as much in the record as possible to help the board decide. But at that time, the board considered that and decided to still revoke your license. So if there's anything you want to provide information, things, you know, why is it different now? Why should the board um, give you this, uh, give your license back? Yes. Um, like I said before, all of the finances, the millions of dollars of debt were all Receded and taken care of. All of my uh, taxes are all caught up. I am sovereign, and um, so being able to whether a new probation or whatever now those in those blockades are now gone. Uh, what do you have in way of a plan if you were to get your license reinstated to restart a practice? Uh, yes, I have um, contacted some colleagues of renting a room and um, practicing, and I have over 7,000 patient files and hundreds of patients that uh, are waiting on the sidelines to come back to see me. They've told you that? Yes. What are you currently doing uh, to, to earn a living? What am I currently doing? Um, right now, I'm just I I I living on my social security. Oh, I'm sorry, you did say that. Okay, I just yes. want to be clear that you're you're saying that at this time, all the financial issues are in the past. You don't have any uh, large outstanding debt or anything like that. I have zero debt now. It has all been cleared up. Um, that's all the questions I have. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it back to the to the judge. Thank you, counsel. All right, we will now go uh, to questions from the board. Dr. Paris, I'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Mr. Zorch. Thank you for being here today. I, I have a um, you you said during your testimony, you made a statement. You said they said there was fraud or whatever in regards to those files. 
And I'm just trying to get um, an understanding of your mindset when you said that. Are you of the opinion that there was no fraud and this was just all a mistake? Or, or can you tell me more about that statement? Um, well, evidently, from what Dr. Krah writing the reports and her girlfriend writing the reports, um, there were violations. No, I was not saying that. But looking at that, if there was fraud like an insurance billing or whatever, I would have had my license revoked. So, um, no, I'm not denying any of those. What was those charges there? No, sir. Thank you for clarifying that. And I'd like to ask, when was the last time as as a licensed DC, when was the last time you you treated a patient? When was the last time you've actually practiced? Um, the, the day that, uh, um, that I lost my license. Can you can you remind me of that date? Um, that was. Um, January 2019. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, I have I have one one further question. The when I looked at um, the CE that was submitted, and I'll reference the um, BCE number twenty and. BCE twenty one. Are those are those the same courses on on different days? Yeah. What happened was that uh, when I had talked to Valerie, and it's updating is that I needed three years, so I was taking online courses of the three years catch up 24 hours for each year. Okay. And then and so you, I had called into the board to verify how to take the classes. So, so those are repeat courses just one day apart. Yes. And then on because I had to, because I had to go ahead and catch up from previous years in order to go for my reinstatement. And I had asked the board, can I take, I had asked Valerie, I need to take, get caught up. So I have 96 plus hours that I had spent um, of the relicensors. So I was taking all the requirements. And she says, no, you're still short. Go ahead and take another course. And then referring to BCE 23 and BCE 25 so those are also the same course yeah those yes mm -hmm. can how often did you simply repeat the same course in making up the ce um it was done over a couple months i don't remember yes okay a yes, number of eventually it was it was taking them and then in order to i was looking online to and I'm talking to Valerie, what do I need to have my license reinstated? She says, you need to catch up on all your hours. So I went back and for first year, the second year and everything. So I was taking courses every week, every month. How else can you catch up, you know? Yeah, I, I think my what my concern might be is that how you catch up is by diversifying your continuing education. It's meant to be um, a, a learning process, meant to be. And so when you're repeating courses, I'm not so sure that it's uh, meeting the goal of taking continuing education. Right. But Dr. So, Paris, I mean, Dr. Dr. Paris, I had called in the board. I said, can I take it from back to chiropractic? Uh, seminars can and I asked her, can I take these in consecutive pieces and they yes they said that yes so your your statement is that they the board I 
told instructed you that it was okay to repeat the courses for to get the appropriate number of CE. Well, I, had, I had to I had to go back and get 24 hours for the first year, 24 hours for the second year. So I had to go back and repeat the courses. Okay, I mean I took a tremendous amount. I was all diversified, so I was learning ethics, I was learning chiropractic tech, technique, philosophy, all the requirements that are on your on there. So um, yeah. I mean, had I been told to diversify or whatever, that that's not in your policy there. No, correct. My my question though is, I'm what are is your statement that when you called the board, you were instructed that it was okay to repeat the same course for credit? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that's all. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. All right, Doctor Adams. Yes. Uh, good morning, Mr. Zorch. Um, just a couple questions here. Uh, when you were having your financial hardships and you weren't and you weren't making your um, required uh, submissions for your probation, did you did you contact the board? And if so, do you have uh, letters or proof that you contacted the board to let them know of your financial hardship? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Do you have do you have copies of the letters that you sent? Um, yeah, it's all in the packets and everything that we sent to them. Yes, probation, yeah. the letters, and everything. Yes, that was in the administrative hearings and everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I looked at the record, there was some twenty four violations. That seems like uh, you know a lot. If you were communicating with the board about your financial hardships, did they did they work with you? Did they give you options as to how you could meet those financial hardships? To yeah, continue to yeah, sometimes they would wait for the payments to come in later, and then eventually I couldn't make the payments right. But the, the person that at that time the person was working with me, I don't remember their name, but yes, they were being very good at letting me delay the audits, the payments, everything. So did you just eventually just stop, kind of give up because the yeah. financial hardship became too much? Yeah, I couldn't pay my mortgage on my house. Uh, the the divorce uh, embezzlement money was taken out. Um, I lost my homes. Um, I couldn't pay my rent in my office. Um, I was, hey. Yes, it was it was not good. Okay. Um, and then your plan specifically, um, you say you have a, you saved up some money to get a, to, to, if you're reinstated to, to start a practice that, um, that you have, um, people that have been contacting you that are waiting to come back to you. What, what specifically are your plans? Do you have, um, an area? Do you have a facility? Do you, are you going to practice with another chiropractor? Are you going to go solo? What's your plan? Yes, I have a couple colleagues of mine that have extra rooms that I can rent. Um, and also, too, I have hundreds of patients um, that are waiting for me to come back. So I do have a plan. Okay. I mean, like, so, I mean, any anything like... Uh, you know locations i mean is there is there yeah i mean I, I mean I, you don't need to reveal all that i'm just saying but but you've got you've got a, a specific plan in place that that uh will enable you to to practice 100 percent um and then as far as uh you've done your, con your continuing education um and just just remind you that you're under oath, but have have you engaged in any uh, chiropractic adjustments with any friends or family since you're revoking of your license? No. Okay. How, how do you feel like you've been keeping your skills sharp? You feel like you've been. It's kind of tough to do that after four years. Um, well, I. Uh, yes, but the amount of time that I practice is very good. And also, too, I use instrumentation. 
So um, my my uh, techniques allow me. I use different types of instruments um, that require not much skill, but um, you know, I had over fourteen thousand patients over that over those years that I had treated, and um, spent a lot of time. So I'm not worried about that. Okay, thank you. So one one final thing, you used the you used the term in your in your testimony uh, when asked a question by the um, the attorney for the state. Um, you use the term that you've resolved your debt, that you are sovereign. And I just, it's always been kind of a buzzword for me. When you use the word sovereign, do you mean that you're solo, that you're, that you're free of debt, or that are you referring to the term being a sovereign citizen? I'm, I'm sovereign, meaning that I have no more debt and that, um, that, um, I envision my life of, of serving mankind and also being able to govern and and um, take care of myself, not relying on my Medicare, my Social Security. That okay. would be sovereign, mainly just being able to be. Once again, I'm I, in the in the community. I donate a lot of times to humanitarian causes and other other things, state and local. And um, so sovereign, I meant mean being in charge, being responsible of a human being, taking care of myself and taking care of other human beings. Thank you. You clarified that for me. I have, I have no other questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sweet. Yeah, good morning. I just have a couple of quick uh, clarifying questions, Mr. Dort. Um, you mentioned quite a bit about the financial difficulty that you were going through. Um, and one of the things that you were asked about was the, the reporting requirements that were part of your probation. Are you, is, is it your testimony that the reason that you failed to submit the quarterly reports um, and several reports after the due date is because of that financial difficulty. I just want to clarify that. Um, yes, I had did I did had called them and told them the reason for that, but also too uh, is it Mr. Sweet? Yes. Also too, I had read a letter on September eighteenth, two thousand seventeen. That I received a notice the board that the examiners that the board decided that the case was with was closed. That was regarding my storage center. I thought it was this probation that I had caught up on my probation. At that time, I was going through my divorce all under this stress, and then I did not file any reports after that, too. But I couldn't I couldn't do the audit, but that was another reason I misread the letter from the storage center. I thought my probation. I didn't have to send in those probation reports anymore. That was my fault. That was an error. That was my mistake. So those were the reasons: financial, and thought I that that report was no more. Reports were sent in. Okay. No, and no one contacted you to let you know that those reports were still required. Um, I was contacted. Uh, I mean, every. Three four weeks with the person that I can't remember her name, but going over these things back and forth, and once again, uh, uh, she helped me tremendously trying to get in. We submitted a tremendous amount of reporting too, but once again, it, but yeah, it was financial, and I was working with them, and eventually, I just couldn't do it anymore. Okay, th thank you for clarifying that. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Ms. Cruz. Yes, um, so looking back at, I think the questions are really gonna be around the safeguards that you're gonna be putting in place. Um, and two things I think about is around kind of the billing, but also around kind of um, the routine reporting. So for billing, you know, I saw that you took courses, so kind of I'm glad that you're kind of looking into kind of what are some options you can do, some best practices there. Um, since there's a strong likelihood that you're going to be kind of um, taking up a space um, at a 
maybe a friend's practice, what are some of the safeguards you're going to be putting in place um, to kind of make sure kind of, kind of certain billing is in line? Will you continue as a cash practice? Will you write kind of what are some of the safeguards you see yourself putting in place kind of when you get to that point? Yes, thank you. Um, I see myself mainly just cash practice. Mm -hmm. So that, that would continue. Yes, and also, like I said before, once I went through all of this, I took billing um, mm -hmm. classes, um, everything learning about collections, mm -hmm. um, contracts of, of about doing um, case fee, cash programs, those type of things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would so you, I have I've updated all of the current laws and regulations for uh, a cash practice. So okay, thank you. And then um, would you say? And then this is kind of also speaking to kind of say the is a community of peers that you're going to be around. Do you would you consider yourself comfortable enough? Kind of kind of even if there's any questions that arise, to ask questions to your peers. Right of of how to handle things because I think where my question is is around this not only kind of what safeguards you have in place one being you going forward with the cash practice but also do you have kind of that community around you to kind of help you if there's any questions that arise so would you feel comfortable enough? Yeah, actually, the two um, colleagues mm -hmm. have practiced for many many years mm -hmm. um, and uh, high standards. They have medical billing. They um, mm -hmm. Uh, they are they're out they have highly regulated mm -hmm. practices and yes and that's one of the reasons is they being updated and being able to have that feedback in an office perfect um, okay yeah that's that's kind of what i was kind of looking for in terms of do you if you, if there were anything to arise right do you have colleagues or peers that you can turn to kind of to kind of bounce ideas off of or ask questions so my absolutely. My kind of other, my second question I mentioned would around kind of the routine reporting. Um, if you were to kind of be required to do kind of continue any kind of reporting afterwards, right? What is your level of comfort in being able to kind of meet those respective deadlines if that was kind of required of you um, after after that? Oh, one hundred percent, because there is no reason not to now. Mm -hmm. And is there? It kind of goes back to the safeguards. Is that is there? Um, is when you say there's no reason not to now, do you mean that um, kind of a lot of, I, and I don't mean to minimize things using this word, kind of distractions, kind of is it that those kind of are out of, the, that were in place at the time or out of the way? Is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, no more questions for me. Right. Thank you. Dr. Daniels. Yes, I have a few questions. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Zorich. Um, some of my questions have been uh, somewhat answered. I, I did want a little bit more clarification on if you could tell me specifically what your understanding of the exact charges that caused the probation to begin with. Um, would be um, note taking. Um, improper billing, um, excessive treatment, meaning that uh, on a couple of the cases, the work comp cases kept dragging out and not knowing what to do with them, keeping training, uh, you know, working with their attorneys. So, and those were in the beginning, not knowing um, the rules of, of work comp and, and personal injury when people are still staying on their uh, care. And so it was, yes, so I'm aware of all of those, if that makes sense. Okay, and um, so in on one of the pages, it's BCE 74, one of the um, charges was uh, charging uh, for work hardening and do you understand the difference, or do you know what? Do you understand what work hardening is versus what you actually performed? Um. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you share that with me? 
um, basically for you mean when I was doing the rehab or also doing modalities with it and um, well, there's a part. procedure code that you use that was for work hardening specifically. Um, yeah, and... that, I think that was for the rehab. So it was a long time ago. Okay. Um, and so do you know what that term means today? There's a. Um, work hardening, yeah. I think it's the, um, the rehab part. Okay. The work hardening of the rehabilitation. Okay. Thank you. Um, sort of to piggyback off a couple of uh, my colleagues, what uh, particular safeguards do you have? Do you have a plan that you say, well, you know, you're sovereign now, but life happens. And if something happens again, uh, what are your, you know, safeguards, your protocol that you see on communicating uh, with the board, not just with the payments, but also uh, not ending up in the situation that you're in. Do you have a clear uh, plan of action? I do, yes. So I have debt-free, I have a low living overhead and um, seeing patients again. Um, I do have other things. I'm writing a book, I'm uh, looking at other ventures around that financially, um, and I also have my social security, too. Okay. So I do have other looking about, as I get into practice, to I have met with my CPA for investing for my future, and so this never happens again, so. Okay. Um, and then you... Uh, attached your continuing ed, and you mentioned that you take care of yourself, you don't drink, you exercise. Um, have there been other things that you've done? I mean, you've been through a lot. Have you had any counseling? Um, and what what kind of support do you have around yourself? Um, yes, I did. Uh, actually, a patient of mine who's a therapist. I spent many, many hours with them professionally. Um, Yes, through meditation, working on myself, um, a lot of self-help books. Um, once again, I've always been successful at being a professional athlete, being an outstanding chiropractor all these years, um, and especially during the pandemic, you know, staying home and realizing what this is all about here on this planet. And um, yes, I've spent a lot of time working on myself and. Starting a new life now. I'm very excited. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, you mentioned briefly community service, um, but it wasn't presented in your documentation. Can you just briefly share with me kind of what community service you performed? Um, I think a lot of it is um, I have friends of mine that um, have uh, anim animal shelters. Um, also doing um, causes at school boards. Um, I have plans to environmental um, issues, things like that. Um, and also, too, I have set aside as as I start to get my practice of going again to donate my time to um, services for the needy, feeding the hungry, and those type of situations. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just one uh, last question. Uh, at the beginning of your testimony, it, it seemed like uh, you were uh, of the opinion that um, this issue came up because of Dr. Craw and uh, her dual duties. Uh, do you feel that that is the reason why you are here or do you um, acknowledge another reason of why you're here? Um, I acknowledge there's another reason why I'm here. Okay. Uh, no more questions. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Mr. Pian, any further questions? No, thank you, Honor. All right. Any further questions from the board? All right. 
Mr. Zorich, um, is there anything else you would like the board to know before uh, they go into closed session to deliberate? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for your time, Council Board meeting. Thank you very much. All right. So, Mr. Zorich, as I said when we started, uh, the board will now go into closed session to deliberate. Uh, you won't have an answer today. You'll be notified of the board's decision at some point in the future, okay? Thank you very much. All right. So, with that, uh, the matter is submitted, the record is closed, and we are off the record. And Dr. Right. Paris, I will defer to you as to uh, how you want to go into closed session. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I would move us to agenda item four and uh, into closed session. Uh, to deliberate and vote on this matter and uh, also to confer with and receive legal advice from our council on another issue. Okay, so uh, let's reconvene to open session. The here, uh, the time is 1140. And so let's, uh, if we can move on to agenda item number six. And board chair's report. Um, well, and I'll be um, fairly brief. First of all, uh, I'd, I'd like to again thank thank staff, um, the dedicated board members. Thank you so much. The the committees um, continue to be um, very busy. Um, there's there's a lot on the committee agendas. We had a March second enforcement committee meeting between our our last full board meeting and we had a March 13th government and public affairs committee meeting. We had a February 24th licensing committee meeting and uh, as we'll see later um, an, a different agenda item, the continuing education uh, committee has been um, very busy. And uh, as as far as an update goes, we, um, we've continued to try and engage our stakeholders and uh and i think that's going really well i think i think my sense is i hope everyone else maybe is seeing this um the the participation in the meeting um the amount of uh interaction that we're getting from the public has i i feel like increased substantially um including comments um from the public and and even written comments submitted to the board for our meetings and um so i feel like the the engagement has um, is bearing fruit in helping us develop regulations and um, and get the public involved in our stakeholders. We, um, Dr. Adams and I, uh, presented a to Cal Cairo at their legislative day um, on April 11th. That was a Tuesday, and uh, I, I thought it went pretty well. Um, Dr. Adams, I would take your feedback from that too. Um, and really, one thing I think that that was really kind of exciting was there was a, a lot of the um that event tends to draw the leadership from cal cairo i feel um a they're of course their board members are there but i think a lot of leaders in the profession in other areas um attend that event so um and there was a lot of interaction and a lot of discussions and i felt like i had um dr adams did you did you seem to have a lot of like sidebar discussions and a lot of people querying you on issues and suggestions and comments Yes, it was it was a great event. It was a great outreach, fitting very much with our with what our uh, strategic plan and our mission, you know, statement is. And I and I felt like it went really well and got to uh, interact and then also to spend time with the staff. I mean, I went over and spent about two and a half hours uh, uh, with the staff and 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 had questions, and it was just really enjoyable and fun and uh, informative. Hopefully, it was for me and hopefully for the staff, and it was just a great a great event. Yeah. Great day. Yeah, thank you for that too. Thank you for taking the day and the time. Um, and on April 17th, um, Dr. Daniels and myself and uh, Ms. Walker, we had a discussion with CCE, um, Council of Chiropractic Education, and the Cairo College reps um, regarding the act and, uh, and the Cairo kind of what the Cairo colleges are facing in regards to our regulations 
uh, the Cairo College regulations and the act. And um, it was it was a really nice discussion. And I think uh, some of those items will be, um, you know, move some of those issues and uh, discussion points that they had to uh, a committee meeting soon, um, the licensing committee likely. So again, thank you all. And, you know, I think 2023, as far as goals, I would just reiterate that if we can continue the, the momentum on the regulatory proposals, um, there's a lot of work going on. And um, so, you know, I appreciate everybody's involvement and your dedication to it. Um, and I also include, and that includes the staff. And so I, I always kind of want to offer up a friendly reminder that, you know, that, that all the, all the work that we do at a committee meeting or at a board meeting, it kind of, it's like a 10 X multiplier when it goes back to the staff. And, uh, so, um, you can't appreciate enough their hard work and, um, the ability to keep it going. And, uh, so thank you to everybody. And I just like to see us continue to, you know, increase our outreach and engagement with our stakeholders. So to any of the board members or the public, um, any of the stakeholders on the call, if there's an opportunity where um, you feel like, you know, we might be helpful, um, we might be able to, um, you know, come and present or answer questions or be available to you in any way, um, please reach out into the board members if you I an opportunity that you think is um, beneficial to us, um, please come back and, and we would we will support that. So that being said, um, I think that's if there's any uh, questions or comments from the board members. H hearing none. Moderator, can we open the board chair's report, agenda item six for uh, public comment? Thank you very much. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on agenda item six, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen or simply raise your hand. We'll give you a moment. All right, I'm seeing no requests for comment. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Okay. Um, that was just informational report, so uh, no action necessary. So if we could move to agenda item seven. And agenda item seven will be an update on the Department of Consumer Affairs by the DCA Office of Board and Bureau Relations. I believe we have Judy Bucciarelli from the DCA Office of Board and Bureau Relations uh, on the line to give us an update. Judy, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Thank you for being here and, and I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thank you. Well, hello and good morning members of the board. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to provide the department Consumer Affairs update today. I'd like to begin with an update related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, also referred to as DEI. Established last fall, the Department of Consumer Affairs DEI Steering Committee is comprised of 12 executive leaders from the boards, bureaus, and department, and has been working on many items, including updating the strategic planning process, training and development of an informational DEI fact sheet, which was distributed to board leadership. I am pleased to report on the progress of the committee's efforts to date. Strategic planning has been updated to embed DEI into the process, which includes a survey DEI section in the environmental scan, video messages, and a brief training video. This month's DCA solid team will be reaching out to your executive officer to develop or update the board's new strategic plan. In addition, all DCA solid trainers will complete a 50 hour DEI training certification program through the University of Massachusetts. The training will expand the availability of courses offered to all DCA employees. 
Employees can access and register now for three DEI courses available in June of 2023. DCA's first DEI fact sheet has been released. It was developed as an informational tool and includes the department's three DEI initiatives developed as an, um, excuse me, and memorializes DCA services that support DEI efforts and includes DEI terminology as it applies to DCA. As the DEI steering committee works to work continues, I look forward to updating you in the months ahead on their progress. Moving on, there are two DCI, DCA wide mandatory trainings for 2023. This includes sexual harassment prevention training and information security awareness. All DCA employees and appointees, including board and advisory council members, will need to complete the sexual harassment prevention training this year. Board members must take the two hour supervisory training, excuse me, that is required every odd numbered year and is online self-paced and approximately two hours. Board members with the signed DCA email are also required to complete the Information Security Awareness Fundamentals Training. This training addresses everyone's role in protecting DCA data and information. The training is online and re required each year. Both the sexual harassment prevention training and information security awareness trainings are available in the department's learning management system, which we commonly refer to as LMS. For more information, a mandatory training page has been created to help members identify, access, and track specified trainings. The page includes direct links to the mandatory trainings as well as pertinent information and policies specific to the training courses. Please go to dca.ca.gov and click on the DCA Board Member Resource Center page under Required Board Member Training. You may also reach out to Chief Deputy Melissa Gear or Assistant Chief Deputy Yvonne Durantes for assistance. As a reminder, the next board member orientation training, known as BMOT, will be held on June 20th, 2023. Board members must complete BMOT within one year of their appointment or reappointment. On June 20th, 2023, BMOT will be offered in person in Sacramento and again on October 10th, 2023 at a location to be determined. Members can register for this training via LMS. As this year's annual Form 700 period comes to a close, the Department of Consumer Affairs and Board and Bureau Relations would like to thank all of our board members and executive officers who helped us achieve compliance. Next, as all of you are aware, legislation passed last year amending provisions of the Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act to extend the ability of state bodies, such as DCA's boards and bureaus, to conduct public meetings virtually through July 1, 2023. Absent the passing of new legislation to extend these provisions, DCA's boards and bureaus will not be allowed to conduct meetings virtually after July 1, 2023. DCA is aware of legislation current recently introduced, SB 54, which removes certain teleconference requirements from the Open Meeting Act. However, this bill does not include an urgency clause and would not take effect until January 1, 2024. Boards and bureaus should be prepared to conduct public meetings in person in the interim beginning July 1, 2023. Next, I'd like to provide information on the federal portability law. On January 5, 2023, a new federal law took effect that enables service members and their spouses who hold professional licenses in a different state to practice in California within the same professional discipline and at a similar scope of practice. 
if they are required to relocate to California due to their military orders. Since becoming aware of the new law, DCA has been collaborating with agency on best how to implement. DCA will share information as it becomes available. In the meantime, your board should your board receive an inquiry from a service member or spouse regarding this new law, please contact the department's legal affairs office. Finally, DCA submitted its 2021-22 annual report to the legislature and the report is now available on the DCA website. This annual report includes a new design and additional reporting metrics such as military licensing data now required for all DCA boards and bureaus. We hope you will take the time to review this impressive compil com compilation of the valuable work of the boards and bureaus. This concludes today's DCA update. And at this time, I welcome any questions from the board. Thank you for that. Um, let me let me open it up for to questions from the board. Hearing none from the board, Ms. Ms. Uh, Bucciarelli, I have a question in regards to the 50 hour DEI certification program. Is, is that available to board members or is that only for DCA uh, staff? Yes. I believe it's just for the uh, DCA solid trainers. However, um, Ms. Walker may want to reach out to uh, Melissa Gear and ask that question. Thank you. Are there any other board member questions, comments? The only comment I have is I'm glad kind of that this that's taking off. I myself is I'm taking kind of a DEI um, certification course myself. So glad kind of we're going in that direction. Yeah. Thank you. I think there might be some interest in a certification program. What I what uh it's through which university did you say? Uh let me check here. I believe University of Massachusetts. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. great. Uh, Ms. Bucciarelli, can we can we open this for uh, public comment? Of course. Okay, thank you. Moderator, can we please open agenda item seven for a public comment? Thank you. I've opened up the question and answer panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on agenda item seven, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists, or you may simply raise your hand. We are displaying instructions, and we'll give you a moment. All right, I see no request for comment. Shall I close the question and answer panel? Uh, yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Okay, um, thank you again, Ms. Bucciarelli. We, we hope to have you back in the future. Okay, you're welcome, thank you. Have a good day. You too. Okay, moving to agenda item number eight. Review and possible approval of January 20th, 2023 board meeting minutes. Um, the, the meeting minutes were uh, a, a, bit, a little bit delayed. And so I was hoping to defer approval to the 7 2023 meeting to give everyone appropriate time to review and, and comment. And, uh, but before we accept a motion on that, are, is there any discussion from the board members on the meeting minutes as is? Hearing none, is there any objection to a uh, a motion to defer approval to the July twentieth meeting? Yeah, this is Sabina. We don't. You don't need a motion. We can always table an item and bring it back if that's what you wish. Okay. Okay. Any any objection to tabling um, this item to the July twentieth full board meeting? Okay. Uh, hearing none, 
Um, we'll table agenda item eight, the approval of the January 20th board meeting minutes to the July 20th meeting. Thank you. Moving to, uh, oh, my apologies. Moderator, can we please open for a public comment? This is Sabina. You don't need to um, have public comment on that since we're just tabling the item. Okay. And let's move to agenda item number nine. Review and possible ratification of approved doctor of chiropractic license applications. Is there any uh, board discussion? I move that we approve the license applications as so stated in agenda item nine. I'll second. Thank you. Hearing no discussion from the board. Moderator, can we open this for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've opened up the question and answer panel. If any member of the public would like to comment, please type comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of the screen or simply raise your hand. We'll give you a moment. All right, I see no request for comment. Shall I close the question and answer panel? Yes, please. Okay. Um, hearing no further comment, um, Mr. Sweet, would you please call the roll for the vote on the motion? Sure. Uh, Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Uh, motion passes. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number 10. Get there. A review and possible ratification of approved continuing edu education provider applications. Um, I'd open it up to the board for any comments, questions, any discussion. Hearing none, I have I have a discussion point. I noted in the pages aren't numbered um, in my packet, but for the application uh, submitted by Michael Wasillison with CE Oversight Contact Person Z Good in our packet, um, I noted that the submitted move you method um powerpoint presentation which i thought was really well done um kind of enjoyed reading it but one of the um the issue i had is it within the within the presentation on ah oh gosh let me see if it's a first second third the fourth page it says uh looks complex but it's simple as uh, as shit is what it says, and I I I think I'm not so sure that we want to um, move forward or approve, you know, the use of any sort of crass or foul language or pot potentially offensive language in you know in a presentation submitted to us. And so I'm hoping that um, we can direct staff to ask him to go through his full presentation and, and then also consider when they're presenting, um, you know, either face to face, live virtual, that um, we remove that language. And so I, I would I would make a motion or I would entertain a motion to approve the remaining provider applications. Um, with the exception of Michael Wasillison and, until we uh, can have that conversation and have him update the presentation material. Uh, 
Are we opening for discussion or are you waiting for a second? Um, well, I was going to entertain the motion. I was, I, I didn't want to make the motion myself at, as, as chair, but if, if there's no support, that's okay too. And we can open it up for general discussion either way. As offensive as I found it, I, I have, I, I have a difficulty with regulating his freedom of express of expression as, as I may differ from it. Um, I, I, and I don't know uh, if there's a, if there's a statute or if we have that, if we have that reach, that's, that was one of my questions, but I, you know, until you brought it up, I'd kind of, kind of forgot about it. <laughs> it was late at night when I reviewed his slides. Is it normal yeah, I, for folks to submit slides? Is it normal practice? Is it an expectation we carry? Or is this just an example of someone who volunteered additional supporting documentation? Well, this is a provider application, so we don't normally get the presentation with mm -hmm. the provider application. So, yeah, I found it. But having that, the fact that he did it, I found it uh, interesting. So I, okay. I, I, I would like you know some input from our legal counsel, whether we can, you know, what our, what the extent of our powers are for, for that. I mean, I, I, I would prefer that they not use crass language in their, in their uh, advertisements, but I don't know that I can, or that we can. Kind of censor in that way. Yeah, I found it off putting and unprofessional when I saw it, but I'm not sure we have a legal. Uh, uh, ability to change that. Yeah, this this is Sabina. Is um is that particular doc I'm trying to scroll to the document. Is that particular document um the app, uh, are you you're just approving the provider application, correct? Not the advertisement or the materials per se. Yeah, we're we're we are in it's uh Ratification of approved continuing education provider applications. Right, so you're just your job today is to approve the provider. Um, I think um, you could ask staff to possibly, you know, remind our providers that they should use professional language um, and that kind of thing going forward. I don't know. She probably also knows that. Um, uh, you know, our regulations don't necessarily say you can't what words you can and can't use, except for it should be not misleading and not, you know, um, false advertising and stuff like that. So identifying, sorry, are, are you saying that the actual material that was submitted, we we should not consider under this agenda item, and that would be something staff would, I considered it as part of his application since he did submit that. Right, so you're just approving this person as a provider or not as a provider. Um, if you think everything else is fantastic as a provider, and it doesn't affect, that particular word doesn't affect how this person might function or be qualified as a provider, then and then you should absolutely um, approve it if you would like for to also in the meantime also direct staff hey you know let's make sure everybody's using professional words you know we're representing the industry here and the profession we want to make sure we're really professional going forward and there's you know we can't uh, we can have them remind the providers of such um, however I I don't recall off the top of my head if there's any other besides uh, advertising um, regulations and statutes that we have saying you can't have misleading or incorrect or false advertising. Um, I don't think there's anything in there that says um, restricts the type of words you can use in their advertising. Kristen, I'm not sure if you know of anything specific. You're correct. So on two points, um, today um, you're being asked to approve his provider application. He did submit that additional documentation as part of the application package. That's why it was presented to the board. But he is assuming he is approved as a provider. He's still going to need to submit the course for formal approval. Um, Sabina is correct. There's nothing in our regulations that specifically um, that we can point to and say that they can't have it in it. Um, but that doesn't mean that during the um, review process for the actual course, we can certainly suggest 
that they may want to take a look at that slide and consider um, maybe updating some of that language. Thank you. Um, hearing that, I would uh, entertain a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the continuing education provider applications. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any other um, board? Discussion, comments, questions? Hearing none. Moderator, can we open agenda item 10 for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have opened up the question and answer panel. If any member of the public would like to comment, please type comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen or simply raise your hand. We are dis us displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, I see no requests for comment. Shall I close the question and answer panel? Yes, please. Okay. And Mr. Sweet, would you please call the roll for the vote on the motion? Yes, Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Sweet is yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Let's uh, going heading to agenda item 11. Get there. Executive officers report and updates and I will turn it over to uh, Miss Walker. Sure, thank you. Um, so my update, we're just past news. Uh, my update this afternoon is going to be um, primer. It's just going to be a verbal on what's been going on here at the board. Um, these first few months of 2023 have been extremely busy for our staff internally. So I just want to take a moment to just acknowledge all of their hard work and um, what they've been, you know, doing these first four months. It's been, um, it's there's been a lot of different uh, projects and um, just different things driven not only by the board, but then also um, there's been a lot of um, requirements coming down from DCA for reporting out data for um, responding to various requests for information. And then we've also now entered um, the legislative session and with all the thousands of bills that come along with that and culling through those and figuring out which ones may affect the board or the profession um, or DCA. So there's been quite a bit going on um, for us internally um i want to begin with um what's been going on with um, our staff and our um and also our board members um i wanted to first uh again congratulate dr paris and dr adams on their recent reappointments to the board um i know i speak on behalf of all staff um that we're excited to have you with us for a few more years um and then we also appreciate all the work of um the all the board members all all five of you um are just amazing you do great work for us um Another uh, update as far as um, people that are working with the board, our former regulatory counsel, Heather Hoganson, accepted a promotional position at another department and she left DCA in early March. Um, our newly assigned re regulatory counsel is Stephen Vong. He's um, he's with us today on the call and he'll he'll join us um, as we review some of the regulatory text. Um, he's really stepped in and assisted us with the text for the three regulatory proposals that the board will be considering today. And I, I think um, I think we have great things to come um, with him working with us to move our various regulations forward. Also have a few updates as far as staff retirements. Um, and one of our enforcement analysts, Christina Bell, who you may be familiar with from all of the mail votes that she would submit, um, she retired from state service in early February. And then one of our special investigators who's um, based in Southern California, Yanti Solomon, is going to be retiring at the end of this month. Um, on the hiring front, we're currently working to fill four vacancies, uh, the first of which is our vacant assistant executive officer position. Um, I've already conducted interviews and I do hope to announce a selection um, of, for that position in early May. We're also interviewing to fill our front desk position. Um, that, that position uh, serves as our primary point of contact for everyone um, contacting the board by phone or email, and they also serve as our cashier. Um, so we are in the interview process and hope to have that position filled soon as well. 
Um, we're also in the process of reviewing applications for a vacant enforcement analyst position, the one that was previously held by Ms. Bell, and also a vacant special investigator position. So we hope to have four new members on board um, by early summer. And then we expect to uh, fill some remaining positions, including um, some associate governmental program analyst positions that we have in administration, enforcement, and licensing in about early to mid-summer. Um, beyond that, I mean, most of the work that we've been doing at the staff level these past few months has really been in three core areas, uh, the first of which is our business modernization project. Um, we've also been working on legislation, which we'll address um, later in today's agenda, and then we've been working on pending regulations. So beginning with the Connect system, um, on February 28th, we implemented a, through a software release enhancements to the applicant and licensee dashboards, um, where we just we updated the look and feel of the dashboard by incorporating various tabs um, so that all the data and information wasn't just you know, strewn about one page. Um, we also simplified uh, the renewal process for the Doctor of Chiropractic license and the satellite certificates. And then we provided a new section on the dashboard where licensees can store their CE records in the system. Um, the exciting thing about that new uh, CE storage option is it's going to benefit not only the licensee for having a having a reliable way to store your continuing education records, um, it will also be valuable to us when we're conducting audits um, with the idea that we can um, be more paper light because we can just prompt licensees to upload their documents there rather than submitting paper um, to the board staff. Um, and then it's also serves as the kind of the primary step before we can, can when we develop our CE provider um, functionality in the system, we want to connect that CE record portal directly with the providers so that upon completion of um, courses, the board approved providers can actually upload certificates and information directly into the Connect system and it'll sync with the licensee accounts. That way we would have primary source verification directly from the providers rather than having to rely on licensees to um, give us the information through audits. Um, that February 28th release date was initially tied to the development of cash sharing functionality in the system. However, um, after we went through a few phases of testing, we revealed or we realized that additional um, work by the developers needed in that area before we can proceed with the cash sharing functionality. Um, luckily, the project uh, the project team did decide to just move forward with the other work that had been completed so that we could prevent any further delays. And we're expecting that the cash sharing functionality will be released. Um, if not late spring, then by early summer, it's just it's something that they're continuing to develop. Um, we did have a system outage for a few weeks in March um, due to some necessary maintenance. They had to take the system down. Um, and unfortunately, when they brought the system back up, it it resolved the issue for why they brought it down. But then it caused a few other issues um, that we had been working through over the last few weeks, the last of which that we're aware of was corrected earlier this week. It had to do with um, our miscellaneous payment portal and there being difficulty for external users to add um, to add uh, transaction types to that system. So there's been a lot of work internally on the staff side of um, identifying and testing the various issues. And we're, we're glad to have that behind us and kind of move forward with this um, software release that's been updated. Um, with it being more stable now, our next step is to begin developing some renewal instructions for our website and then widely publicizing the Connect system to licensees beginning next month. Um, the goal is to really to drive traffic to the Connect system so they can effectively renew their licenses online. Um, and the benefit of the system is that your license renewal is processed in 48 hours automatically um, rather than you know relying on mailing time plus cashiering plus someone to manually key in the renewal. So that's that's where we're at with the Connect project. Um, another exciting kind of development with the Connect project is that we were offered the opportunity to upgrade to the latest version of the system. So BCE is actually going to be the first of the four programs in cohort one to upgrade to this um, newer version of the system. Um, the second cohort of other DCA boards is already using that version. So so it's tested. Others have used it. We're just going to be the first of those um, initial boards to make the leap. Um, while the overall function and the feel of the system is going to remain the same, what the version upgrade is going to do is allow us to have greater control over the system configuration and workflows so that we can easily update our form content um, and make just minor changes to the system without having to involve um, a system developer, which in the long run is going to substantially save us money and also time because we're only allocated a certain amount of developer hours per month that we can use and we won't be utilizing them 
on more minor changes. We can do those internally and let the developers work on um, the major tasks like CE functionality. Um, that new version is also going to allow us to link multiple user types, like um, allowing a licensee to also be a CE provider on the same account, whereas our current version would require that under those circumstances, the, the individual would actually need to create two separate accounts to perform each of those functions. So that's also an added benefit, especially given that many of our CE providers are small businesses and also licensees. So, you know, they can utilize both functions within the same account just by separating um, different tabs at the top. So we had a few uh, preliminary meetings planning out the project. Um, we're looking at making that transition over the summer, um, and we're really excited to see that unfold. Um, the, and like I said, the other major thing that we've been working on has been our pending regulatory proposals and the planned process improvements that go along with those. Um, we currently still have, we have that list of 20 pending regulatory proposals before the board. Um, we had a section 100 action to repeal the sponsored free healthcare events regulations based on the repeal of the underlying statutory authority. Um, that file was um, submitted to the Office of Administrative Law on March 22nd. Um, later today, the board is going to be considering proposed text for three of those regulatory proposals, um, filing of contact information, cases involving sexual contact with a patient and sex offenders, and continuing education later during today's agenda. And then staff is also developing regulatory packages to repeal Section 354, the obsolete provision that allows for unlicensed practice prior to licensure, and to update the delegation of authority to the assistant executive officer and citation program packages. In addition, staff is working on developing proposals for um, discussion at the committee level regarding temporary licensure for military spouses, um, record keeping requirements for chiropractic patient records, um, discipline by other public agencies and licensee reporting requirements, disciplinary guidelines and uniform standards for substance abusing licensees, um, the process, evaluating the process for petitioning the board for reinstatement of a license, reduction in penalty or early termination of probation, and um, supervision of unlicensed individuals within chiropractic practices. Staff has also been working on developing some background information on chiropractic college regulations, preceptors, and postceptorship requirements and reciprocity requirements in other states in preparation for discussion by the licensing committee at future meetings. So that's that's in a nutshell what we've project-wise what we've been working on. Um, taking a look at some of the statistics and where we're at um, as far as licensing, um, we're really trending with what we saw in the last fiscal year. As of um, actually as of today's date, we've issued 309 doctor of chiropractic licenses. Whereas last fiscal year we issued 332, so we're we're very comparable there. Um, corporation certificates again in line. We've issued 89, and last fiscal year we issued 102. Um, where we've surpassed already last fiscal year is with new satellite certificates. So as of today's date, we've already issued 1,288, whereas in the entire last fiscal year, we only issued 1,270. So that's a trend that we've kind of been seeing this whole fiscal year of we're seeing an increase in satellite certificates by licensees compared to what we had been seeing um, you know, during the pandemic, which is to be expected, but is an increase in workload. Our licensing population type is very comparable to what we've been seeing all fiscal year. Um, currently, doctors of chiropractic, we have 12,222. Um, corporations, we have 1,363. And satellite certificates has continued to increase. We currently have 4,705. Um, what staff is really working on with statistics is um, developing a way that we can provide a little bit more meaningful data um, during a board meeting and then also through regular reports. Um, in the past, generally when it comes to licensing and also with enforcement, we're mostly just reporting volumes, but we want to increase um, reporting as it relates to the timeframes for approval at various steps in the process. And then we also want to measure trends over time. So we have the data on volume, we have data on um, the timeframes, and then we're working with the department's Office of Information Services to develop reports that will measure uh, trends over time. So we expect at least some of that new data to be um, presented to the licensing committee for their input at their upcoming May 12th meeting. As far as enforcement, um, with complaints and investigations, uh, we've received 353 complaints so far this fiscal year. We've closed 250 cases, leaving us with a pending caseload of 463 complaints. Um, our historical average over the previous few years hovered between 500 to 500. 
590 pending complaints. So that number is lower. However, at the end of last fiscal year, we were at 360. So we are trending 100 cases higher than where we were at in um, on June 30th of last year. So really the focus for enforcement for the remainder of this year is going to be on addressing those pending complaints to the extent that we can and trying to get that that number down to something that's a little bit more manageable for staff. As far as disciplinary cases, we've reduced the number of pending cases um, from our peak of 107 at the end of last fiscal year to um, just 61 as of today. Um, that was to be expected because as we observed uh, during the pandemic time, um, staff caught up on cases and made a large number of referrals to the Attorney General's office at right around the same time that there were delays in scheduling hearings and getting pleadings served, which kind of led to us having a higher number than normal at the Attorney General's office. And as those cases have now been adjudicated, um, they, that, pe that pending number continues to de decrease, which is what we were really expecting to happen. Um, there's also it's also due to efforts by staff um, to really review and settle pending cases where we can so that we can avoid the additional time and expense of hearings. Um, with the adjudication of those cases, as expected, our probation caseload is now increasing a bit as um, as those closed cases become new probationers. So we've we've now increased to 75 probationers that we're currently monitoring through our probation program. Overall, our budget and fund condition is looking good. Uh, so far this fiscal year, we have significant cost savings from staff pay and benefits, um, and also from legal fees from the Attorney General's office. We're currently assessing um, our budget situation and planning for next year. What we, we do expect to have similar savings in Attorney General's costs next year, um, but our staff, um, our staff uh, expenses and benefits will certainly increase as we increase hiring. Um, we do expect to revert, though, a significant amount of savings this fiscal year um, back to our fund. And then also highlighting on our strategic plan objectives. So as I had kind of highlighted, really the focus has been working on the pending regulatory proposals and the objectives that are tied to those. Um, we are a bit behind on some of the internal process improvements that have been contemplated and discussed through our strategic planning, specifically on um, you know, developing some better reports that can go to the board members and developing, you know, our board member resource center. So that's something that we're going to um, we're going to continue through this fiscal year to catch up on those regulatory proposals and then shift focus back onto ensuring that we're getting that documentation um, updated and prepared. So um, that really concludes what I had to highlight today. I'd happy to answer any questions from the board um, on any of the internal operations. Thank you. Um, that was very thorough, detailed. Appreciate that. Um, let me open it to the board for any uh, comments, discussion, questions. I just again want to reiterate, you know, what a great job, you know, and and the volume of information yeah. that you guys have compiled and put together. It's been really helpful, and and I know you're doing it short staffed, and you're and you're doing great. And and to the staff that's listening, it was wonderful to meet with you. You guys do a great job. We appreciate that. And let us know how we can help in, in any way to lighten your load and to, uh, um, you know, make uh, the board run more efficiently and effectively for you guys. But uh, great job. And just, you know, kudos to you, Kristen, for a great uh, for a great year. A lot has been accomplished in my in my estimation in the, what is it, 14 months now that you've been at the helm there. So thank you. And to the staff. A request that I have is kind of an understanding that um, kind of things may have to be shifted along the um, kind of maybe have a potential shift in deliverables when it comes to um, the strategic plan. Um, so I just imagine in kind of the corresponding committee meetings, if there is a shift um, kind of in any of the timeline, kind of just to let us know there. Yes, that's going to be that's definitely going to be one of the discussion topics for the government and public affairs okay. committee meeting coming up in June. And then also, as um, Ms. Bucciari mentioned in her update, um, there's going to also be some changes that need to be made to the strategic plan to incorporate um, the governor's directive related to DEI. So both of those um, will be discussed at the, ideally discussed by the government and public affairs committee meeting in June. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I I would just like to emphasize how 
I mean, it, it feels like we've moved into another century. Like we went to the, now we're arriving in the 21st century with, you know, I mean, I mean that kindly, um, you know, with like CE storage in our connect system, um, direct source verification, um, license renewals, you know, in, in 48 hours, um, which is something that um, was, was something that was important to when we were at meeting with Cal Cairo, um, that, that topic came up numerous times. So I think that's going to be well received with our licensees, stakeholders, et cetera. So um, thanks again. Any more comments, uh, discussion from the board members? Okay. Um, hearing none, a moderator, can we please open agenda item 11? Thank you, Mr. Public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've opened up the question and answer panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on agenda item 11, please type comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. Or you may simply raise your hand and we'll give you a moment. All right, I see no requests for comment. Shall I close the question and answer panel? Uh, yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Okay, um, that was informational, so no vote needed. I think seeing it's 1230 um, currently, if we can break for 30 minutes uh, as a lunch break and we will come back at one o'clock and um, we will proceed with the agenda item number 12, our licensing committee report at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. 